Go ahead, please. Good afternoon and welcome to the October 26, 2020 Governing Board Study Session. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, you know, Mr. Sullivan, can we just do a roll call? Yes, I'd be glad to, Mr. Chair. Damian Klinko. Present. Meredith Hay. Dr. Hay, do we lose you? She's on, I see her on. Dr. Hay, are you there? Okay, let's continue. We'll go stuff. back to her. I see um, her. Mark Hanna. Here. Maria Garcia. Here. Luis Gonzalez. Here. Meredith Hay. Here. Okay, Here. glad to report we have now have all board members present. Terrific. Thank you very much. So we have a uh, we have a very hefty agenda today, and we have four uh, major presentations. So we have thirty minutes assigned for each of these. Uh, so I'm going to try to really for so we don't run out of time. Uh, and we also have the one action item. I'm going to really try to hold everybody to the time frame. So the first item is two point one educational and facilities. Uh, breaking up. You're breaking up, Damian. Okay. Is that? Uh, I'll, I'll yeah. Uh, you're good. You're okay. good. I'm not sure why that's happening. I apologize, uh, but I'm going to try to hold everybody to the time frame. And the first item on our agenda is the 2.1 Educational and Facilities Master Plan update. Chancellor Lambert. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I have uh, Bill Ward and Michael Smith on to, to just give us a, a brief update on where we are with the uh, master planning work. Bill? Yes, and uh, as I'm a, Michael, are you on? I'm here and I'm ready to share when you when you let me know. Yeah, I'm ready for you to share. So, so just to let you let the our, our Chairman Klinko, members of the board, Chancellor Lambert, uh, students, colleagues, and guests. And so, just to kind of let you know, uh, we wanted to give you a brief update in preparation for uh, uh, a study session or that or a meeting that we will we, we will be having with the board in December related to the final steps on the edge and the educational facilities master plan. And so uh, we just wanna kind of give you an overview of what we've done so far. Um, our goal is to have everything pretty much completed, like I said, by the end of this calendar year. So as you can see, the, re the review efforts to date, we, we, we had a very strong planning process. Uh, state, we've done completed stakeholder interviews um, campus planning goals, you can see that, that we've also taken a very, very hard look again at our spatialization and, and our district-wide analysis. And just so you know, what, we're, what we've been looking at is, is all pre-COVID. Now we are assessing things related to COVID too, but the majority of the stuff when it relates to spatialization and analysis is pre-COVID. And so um, you, can, you can list there's the different priorities. So one of the things we want you to see is our schedule. So you can see where, you know, when we started and kind of where we are today, we're in the refinement and documentation mode. So we're in four and five on the schedule. Um, and then we just wanted to kind of give you guys a brief overview of what you're gonna see in, the, in December. Next slide. Um, and so these are all the stakeholder interviews that we've had. Um, I don't have to go through the whole thing. You guys can read these quickly because uh, I know the time is up. But you can see that we pretty much met with everybody throughout the college district and outside the college. Um, and that's exactly what we did last time when we brought in our planners. Um, and, and the whole idea is for the board to understand is, you know, this is kind of a six year look as to where we started what we, what we said we were gonna do, what we did, what we, what we weren't able to do, or what maybe we did that, that we've added to the plan that was not necessarily part of it. But you can see all the different interviews that we've had. Next slide. And then here are our major, major emerging themes that closely align with our institutional goals. As you can see, enhance the student success through pathways and centers of excellence, address issues of equity and social mobility, optimize physical spaces realign with post-pandemic realities. This has been a big thing for us because this was not something that we planned to do, but COVID happened. So it is, it is what it is. Um, create customized learning experiences. That's a 
that's one of the things that we've been taking a very, very hard look at. And also too, related to our space, um, which we'll get into that here later with one of the presentations that we're gonna do, because we're really looking at, does our space support where we wanna go in the future of education? Also to support online education growth and strategies, that's something the team has taken a very hard look at and had a lot of meetings related to it. And, and then you can see our changing space needs and, and continue to cultivate community engagement. And, and I will say that our business and industry partners, our city, county, state, uh, and anybody, pretty much everybody that we've been interviewing has been majorly involved in giving us information. No issues in my opinion. And so here are our drivers, our planning drivers aligned with the PCC strategic goals, reduce capacity constraints on and or increase efficiency, support student success completion. Says you, we can go through the whole thing, promote community and, and or economic development, which is something that our community is not just Pima, but our but our community in a sense is talking about this too. Enhance collaboration among campuses or units. So one of the things that we made very clear is is that this is a team effort, and we everybody's views whether whether we're going to do it or not, or, or uh, as information that we want to capture for future. And then also too, we're looking at our deferred maintenance related to the college district and, 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 and provide cost savings and then enable flexible implementation plans. Next slide. Oh, that's the last one. That's the last one. So just to, you know, the one thing we wanted the board to know is, is you're gonna have a pretty thorough presentation come uh, December. Um, we've put a lot of work on it, a lot of meetings that we've had uh, in the time frame. I think we've had over 36 meetings, stakeholder meetings, or I'm not sure, Michael, you know that off the top of your head. And we've met with close to 200 people throughout our community. Any questions? Yes, yes. sir. Phil, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Here, Mr. Um, Bill, um, so we're going to meet in December to kind of go over this more in detail. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And so this is the facilities plan. Is there, is the education this, plan? Oh, no, this is everything. This is everything that we've looked at. Um, it's the education and the facilities plan. I was just tasked to give you guys a brief overview. When we give the presentation in December, it will include, you know, my team, Dolores's team, and Dave Dory's team. Okay. And were you, as part of the outside stakeholders, were you able to meet with Job Path? I'd have to check with Michael on that. Michael, Michael attended all the meetings with the stakeholders. I don't know if that's one of the groups that we have met with to date, but that's not to say we couldn't meet with them. Okay. So, I'm, so Michael, you may want to weigh in on that. So yeah, Job Path was invited as part of our workforce meeting that we had with outside stakeholders. Uh, we did have a number that weren't able to attend um, all the stakeholder meetings, but we followed up with them with a survey as well. So if there are any particular insights that someone can offer us, we still have time to get those to our planners. Okay, I would just, okay, thanks. So, so Mark, uh, to, to your question, you're going to see the educational pieces in December, but what we're finding is many people want to locate to downtown campus now. So, so a lot time. of the programs want to be there. Uh, downtown has become like the, no. the place to be. Um, anyway, so, but we, you know, obviously we can't do that. And so we'll have that all hopefully apportioned out in, in a balanced way come, come December. But Chancellor and, and, and board member Hannah, we are planning on providing some space for job path in the center of excellence of applied technology. Yes. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. I know there are ED in case you need me to introduce you to her. Just kidding. <laughs> and Bill, could you? Oh, Ms. Garcia, do you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Are uh, we going to, are we going to, um, be given some information on the specifics of about what the stakeholders had to say about our, the plan. We have a we we've captured all of that information, uh, um, board member Garcia, and and we will be providing that. I mean that 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 we'll be prepared to answer any questions when we give the presentation, and we'll have a completed document that will have all that in it. Doesn't mean we'll necessarily go through all of it, but we will have 
all of the information that the, our stakeholders provided. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Ward, could you just remind us um, just sort of in terms of a timeline, you know, I mean, since I've been on this board, we went through the very first strategic and facilities master planning process, which was a very deep dive. And now this is really sort of an update, correct, of the, yeah. of the plan to just sort of reassess what we're achieving, where we're heading, what still is relevant, rather than just continuing to use uh, like now a four-year-old plan where we really felt it was important. Could you provide a little bit? Actually, of ex excellent question, Chair Klinko, because when I talked with the chancellor about this the other day is we're, you know, as you guys know, add in facilities plans are usually 10, like a 10 year plan. And then you usually start your, 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 your next planning phase around six, seven years is kind of where we're at. And so since this is the, in a sense, the same plan and we built on it, we've, we've, we've added some things to it. We've taken some things away from it. We're actually looking at it in a sense as if it's a 15 year plan. And so we, we will continue, like, like, you, like you mentioned, to, to show where, where, we, where we were, where we've come, but also to where we plan on going. And there are gonna be some things that we recommend that are, that are related to change. And that maybe we did not cover the last time, but with, since we have this up. So I would say it's more, it, I would say this is another deep dive it's just that we did a lot of the work the last time, and so we don't have to go out and redo that, but we are taking another deep dive and hard look at, at our institutions. Well, Mr. Ward, I think as part, of our, as part of the December item, you know, I think it would be useful to sort of have a sort of a broad overview of, of just sort of the planning process since, you know, we're, the board is in transition, we'll have a new member who, you know, will be seated in January. Um, I, I think just sort of giving a sort of a refresh because it's really this plan that was in many ways the driving factor for one, well, the centers of excellence and the infrastructural investments that we've made, but also the acquisition of, of um, funding from the state of Arizona for the, um, for the aviation program. I mean, these were directly related to a very strategic initiative and how we sort of built these two dovetailed uh, you know, plans together. And so I, I think sort of revisiting them would be useful. Definitely. We can do, we, I think that's a great idea. We will ensure uh, that that's part of the presentation. And I think too, you bring up a good point because we're going to have a discussion here in a little while also related to something that was captured in this plan to begin with related to our health services area. And so totally agree. I mean, it's been a long walk for us and there has been a lot of work done in, in our and we, we do have that all captured, so we'll be able to show that. And then the other thing I just want to point out, most places don't build these plans in an integrated way. Uh, so what we've done is to build an integrated plan where you take the educational pieces with your facilities pieces, and that's something uh, to not lose sight of. But also, um, I don't think Pima had put together a master plan of this sort in a very long time. So this has been very new, if you will, uh, uh, to the college, especially the integrated approach, as well as you'll find across the country. Yes, Ch Chancellor, I think prior to us, when we started the last time, I think it had literally been 20 years since the college had done an, an, an in-depth assessment, assessment like this, but we had never done anything like you just mentioned to where we did it all at the same time. And as you all know, we've been contacted by, by colleges and universities throughout the nation um, asking us how we did it. And so that's, that's something that we're very proud of. Any more questions? Looks like we're ahead of schedule. Okay, well, I was wanting to move it along for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so our, our next item, I'm just trying to find the agenda here on my screen. Um, the next item is the um, item 2.3. Um, I apologize. West Campus. Oh, yeah, yes, the West Campus update. So would you like me to just go ahead and provide yes. the backdrop? So as you know, uh, uh, we had earlier brought to the board a plan to build new, and then we had looked at different options, uh, and then we were really considering going down the new path. 
I think the board was supportive of build new different part of the West campus and then COVID hit. What COVID has really done is allowed us to step back and realize we now have to take more and more of our programming into the virtual space. But as we do that, it also opens up opportunities for programs that have to have a physical space component to it. So as a result of that, we went back and took another look, uh, especially as it relates to our healthcare programs, to see if we can renovate uh, enough space that would be akin to what building new would be. So what you're gonna see uh, here shortly is that proposal for a renovation approach. And then what we need from the board is to get a, a sense of, do you want us to go with the new or go with the renovated approach? Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, Michael, why don't you go ahead and put the presentation up and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit to the board before we get rolling. Um, so as the, as the chancellor said, as the chancellor stated, and I, I think I mentioned it a little earlier, as part of our ad and facilities planning assessment that we had done had started in 2014 um, related to the, the district, it was, it was recommended when that plan went to the board for final approval in 2018 that we consolidate all of our health uh, facilities. Um, you know, all, our health programs to the West Campus. And so this isn't anything that, that, uh, that we just decided to do. This was actually a, a strong recommendation within our plan. And so with that said too, um, as part of the plan, tip, we also talked about issues related to our science labs and training space at the West Campus as it being outdated, not being user friendly, not, not being able to use the labs for more than one use. And so what I, what I would like to do with the board pleasure here with the, and the chancellor is, is kind of kind of quickly go through this to get you to the point where we start talking about the space. And then we've got Yolanda um, McCoy Stokes. So Yolanda is our acting director of the health services program. I think it, it, it West or throughout the district. And Dave Dory will, President Dory will also be participating with us. Mr. So, Mike, why don't you go to the first Ward, you're, you're fading in and out a little, so if you... Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, this is the, you guys can see, this is the footprint of the West Campus. So, we just wanted to kind of give you an idea. You know, we're sitting on about 260-something acres of land. It's Bureau of Land Management land, so the college can develop as long as we receive approval prior. Next slide. So, if you look to the, the top left-hand corner, you'll see a little blue facility that's up there. They, those are actually, that's actually the portable building that we received from the Marana School District that we are actually rebuilding uh, up there on the hill. And the reason why I wanted to show you all that is because that is the space that we will be moving some of our science lab groups to as we renovate another facility. But the cool thing about it is, once you go to the next slide, as you can see that uh, it's gonna give us some dis additional uh, classroom space, which, uh, which I'm sure Dr. Doyle will talk about here shortly. So the idea is we get, we get four nice classrooms as part of the facility that we got. And then we're building a new little bathroom building up there on the hill so that the students don't have to uh, you know, go to the main campus. And then you guys can read the, the rest here for yourselves. Next slide. All right. Although, so, so Dave, you may want to talk a little bit about how you guys are going to use, utilize that facility and, and during, once we have that thing ready to roll. Yeah, so, um, and, and uh, Aubrey Conover is here to, to weigh in as well. So, uh, essentially, this, these rooms really do give us a lot of flexibility, particularly for our science area, uh, which is where we have one of the most, um, you know, needs right now. Uh, so, uh, that's a that's that's four good classrooms that uh, we're really looking for. And Bill, we appreciate that you're putting a restroom up there for the students. Yes, thank thank you. We're we're excited. Years ago, to let you all know that we had, I think it was the CDC that was up there on the hill. They had did some special project, and they put all the utilities up there, and then left, and then they left it there, so we were able to reutilize it. So, next slide. So so we're building. The reason we're doing that spot. And we just, Dave just talked about is because the, the thank you board, you guys approved a year or so ago and as part of the Ed and Facilities Master Plan for us to remodel the building that you can see, the F building. 
um, which which is the main part of the campus is where we have some a lot of our science labs located. The idea is to totally renovate that facility uh, and, and, and come up with some new space for the, for the department and actually space that can be utilized multi-use. And we wanted to include this so you could get an idea to see kind of where, why we're recommending, or in a sense, a remodel and also a potential building. Dave, any thoughts about this? Or well, actually here, I'll let you take it from here. So um, the next couple of slides just uh, show the board the specifics of the, the uh, science labs that are being renovated. So as you can see, we've got two microbiology, two or, or uh, chemistry, and then the prep area. And then Michael, you wanna go to that next slide. And then we have uh, uh, four for the chemistry and then the, the prep area. And, uh, and then Bill can talk about how, how we're going to plan for this uh, in terms of moving those, those classes uh, in, number one, into those portable spaces as well. And if you have any, any, any specifics, uh, Aubrey can, can help answer those questions as well. Yeah. But I think to the chancellor's point, what we're seeing in our science division is they are moving, they're, you know, they're going to move to a new normal post-COVID. So we will be seeing much more hybrid models in sciences. So essentially they'll be coming into the labs uh, not necessarily as frequently as they have in the past. So, so I think that's gonna free up some of this square footage demand that we have. Agreed. Next slide. And so but before I get on, before I move on to this one to tie into what Dave is saying related to, to that facility, the other thing to let the board and team know is we're not just remodeling the space. We're actually, we are going to be replacing the air conditioning system for that whole facility. And so it will be a totally refurbished space for use for our, our, our science and potentially medical programs. And so we wanted to let you know as, as part of the Ed facilities plans, this is what was recommended is, is that we move nursing, radiology, dental, and all these different different programs to the West Campus. Um, and so uh, uh, to consolidate everything, the only thing that we weren't talking about moving at the time, and we're probably not going to move is our vet tech program. But all of these other programs were slotted to move. And uh, Yolanda, you may wanna talk a little bit about this uh, related to the programs, these different programs moving to the West and, and And Bill, I just wanted to, to, to for, for the board members that don't know uh, Yolanda, uh, Yolanda's our, our acting dean of health sciences. So she has graciously uh, stepped in and hit the ground running uh, to fill the gap of uh, Joe Gaw. So and it's so nice to have Yolanda. Here. Before yes. we move on to this part of the presentation, does the board have any questions about the phased renovation approach of those labs? Okay. Go ahead, Yolanda. So thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me to come and um, participate in this meeting. I think one of the keys um, with moving the, the center of excellence and moving in this direction was this provides each one of our health programs with the ability to take our laboratory space and turn it into a multi-use area. And I was sharing this with, um, with Bill and David DeRay a little bit earlier that our accreditors are moving in a direction of um, incorporating interprofessional education into our programs. And we've been able to start doing that already. Um, this will allow us to take a dental student and a nursing student and place them together into an environment where they're providing education to patients, education with each other and collaborating with each other, just making their educational experience even greater. And also, um, one other thing that we were moving in this direction too, because I think like um, David DeRay just mentioned with science and you know us moving into a new normal post COVID, um, we've moved into a virtual environment and more of a hybrid type environment as well. And this is, uh, has allowed us to move into areas that we've wanted to move into, but we haven't necessarily been able to make that jump. And that's 
bringing students in from Nogales that's interested in nursing that didn't have the ability necessarily to drive five days a week to Tucson to participate in these programs and students that are in Sales, Arizona that's interested in nursing, we can take the classroom right to them, whether it be their skills labs or their um, their lecture component. So we're super excited about the new the direction that we're going in and our ability to um, really serve Southern Arizona in a way that we would like to. Thank you, Yolanda. Next slide. All right, so um, as we get, why don't you go on ahead and uh, as you guys know, we, we took a hard look like the chancellor said earlier about the space related at West Campus. Our first look, uh, it was to look at potentially building a new facility and so that, so we, what we ended up doing is we had brought an architect on board anyways to look at the labs and, and the land, the medical labs and things like that. So they worked with us on an assessment, which you guys had already saw, has seen before, but you're gonna see again related to a new facility. Um, but I just wanted to say that again, next slide. So this was what their recommendation was, and just to let everyone know, we worked, and I know Yolanda was probably involved with this at the time, but we worked very hard with Joe Gall on the development of this originally proposed project. Joe worked directly with our team, provided all of his recommendations for space needs, uh, um, what all would go where and how it would work. And so that was all incorporated into our, our, our design cost and estimates related to these facilities. I just want to let you guys know. Next slide. And, and, and well, the reason we picked this area for a new facility is because the ground is, is already potentially developed in a sense. Um, West Campus is considered uh, land that would have to be assessed related to burial ground and other things, but this part of the property has had some assessment when we built the CFA facility. And so that's why this site was picked. And plus, we also thought that we would uh, cut in a new road potentially if this was approved to where people would just access the facility from, from uh, Ankle. Next slide. So you can see with, with option one, uh, what we would have been doing was adding 19 classrooms, tolling 20,520 square feet, 16 labs, tolling 35,300 square feet. The total square footage, as you saw on the last side, is about 75,000 for this new facility. Next, next slide. Okay, so it, so what we're what we wanted to see you all to see today is so you've seen the other one before. So here's the, the the additional recommendation. And so what we're recommending to the board and to the leadership here is is that we look at the idea of remodeling space instead of building new space. As you all know, West, West Campus is going to be celebrating or is has already turned fifty. These two facilities that you see in blue are original. They have original equipment in them. Um, you know, when I mean original, I mean the air conditioning, the electrical, that stuff is all, all 50 years old in a sense. And, and so we wanted to show you, these are identical footprints. They're almost the same build type of building that was built on either side of the, of the, of the other facility that we told you. And this is where we would be expecting that the programs would, would be going to. Um, would be moving to these facilities and then there's another building that's going to pop up to here that you guys will see. So H building has 18 classroom, 31 offices. J has 22 classrooms and 30 offices. And you can see the average classroom adequacy is about 48%. Next page. So what we want, what I wanted the, the board and everyone to see here is, as you see the, 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 the colors that we have there, we have a, a spot that's red or like a reddish color and then a greenish color. So the reason we want, what we want to show you um, is, is that the red is where we have storefronts. And so our recommendation is gonna be able to, our, our recommendation would, we would want to add a little space to these facilities and these are already existing storefronts, but we may want to bring them out. So it's most likely structural aluminum or steel. It's not gonna affect the structure of the facility related to our historic assessment that we're um, for, for West Campus. But we just wanted to see you to see that it was additional space that we could potentially capture as we remodel these facilities. The green that you see there is, is related to elevators. So 
So we have each one of these buildings has an elevator in it. They are uh, have been grandfathered in, but they are not up to today's standards. And so this is something that we would need to look out, look at. Now, just because we're showing that odd box, that does not mean that that would be that would be added to it as off right off right off the bat, depending on our assessment. But we wanted you to see that there was some potential space that we would want to capture, plus do some do some stuff related to our elevators. And then you're going to see here in the next slide, Michael. So Dave, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, how you would see the, 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 the different, you know, these different floors being utilized for your programs. Um, but you guys, if, I mean, if you would like to weigh in on, you can actually see what we did was we cut this out by floor. So you guys could kind of see what's there and what's, what's in a sense uh, being proposed. Or we can keep moving. It's up to you guys. Yeah, uh, Yolanda, do you do you want to say anything about th this again? Comparing this to the to the new building, I think comparing this would give us just so much more um, skills lab space. And looking at this, it's I can see where the open areas are that are now classroom space, and that's been that's been something that's been a challenge for us um, during COVID was having enough space to bring to actually bring the students in to make up for some lost, say, clinical time space that's out in the um, the actual hospital setting. Excellent. Yeah, and I I just want to really echo I, I think Bill's comments. You know, this gives us an opportunity to completely renovate these old buildings as opposed to, because uh, if we build new, we're still gonna have to deal with, with these structures. Uh, exactly. And again, looking at a post COVID uh, learning model, uh, we, we really, I, I think, wanna be much more efficient with our use of square footage. Excellent, next slide. You could just, we'll just go through these slides real quick. You guys can actually see what the space would be looking like. And the reason why we picked this spot is because it ties to that building that's already being remodeled, as we talked about before, with a bunch of new multi-purpose labs that could potentially be used by our science group and our medical group, which Yolanda just explained. And so the other thing that we've talked about, and we're not saying this has to happen, but we did look, we are looking at the H building to the, in a sense to where if the college wanted to, and we did, uh, add some additional space that there could be the opportunity and I, and Chancellor, I apologize. I did not share, hadn't shared this one with you yet um, about the idea of potentially building a, a fourth floor conference room, like a very large box sky box that would look out over the campus that could be used for whatever. Um, but we wanted you guys to kind of just see some ideas that we were thinking about next page. And then there's and now there's the elevator tower. So the other one would also include an elevator tower too. Next slide. And then after all, the idea would be once we would finish with the bit, you see the blue building, the, the D building, the, the building that's caddy corner to it. Um, once we were to finish with, with that facility, then most likely we would use the D building for staging. And so then the idea would be we would we would remodel H and J and then eventually we would go to D. And so with the cost that was proposed earlier, I think it was 20, 20 something million dollars, we would be able to literally remodel three of our facilities instead of building one new one. And so just wanted to show you that also. I wanted to show that to the board. Next slide. And then this is what would actually be happening. You guys can talk, you, Yolanda, Dave, you guys can talk a little bit about that space. I know you'd be excited to be able to use it for something else. So. Right. And Aubrey, do you want to weigh in a little on this? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things to think about, especially with this D building, is we will be displacing people from these other buildings. And it gives us an opportunity to create a unique space on campus for some of those programs and classes that we'll be displacing. Um, I think the one thing that we do need to keep in mind that Bill mentioned is a lot of these classrooms in these buildings will be multi-purpose classrooms. So we can use them for sciences, we can use them for some of the other classes that are in demand and tie connect directly to these programs. And one of the other benefits that I think we really need to stress about this center is by bringing these students together, you know, we have an amazing waiting list for nursing. 
It's kind of the, the program out there that everyone knows and everyone wants to be part of. But we have amazing opportunities in some of our other health professions. And by bringing these students together and allowing them to learn together and see the different opportunities and different branches that they might follow, uh, I think it really will be a benefit to all of our programs across the board. Thank, Thank you, you, Aubrey. Excellent. Next, okay, and then you can see, so option two, existing building H, J, and D. So we would be, we'd have 30, 33 classrooms totaling 21,700 square feet, 15 labs. And then after we renovate it, we would, they would that would go up to 34,700 square feet and then 23 labs with a total of 45,800 square feet. So one of the things the board and, and those of you that haven't walked the facilities before that I would say, and I know Aubrey and Yolanda can definitely weigh heavy on this is, even though we have a lot of space at West Campus throughout the years, and I, and I hate to say this, but the space has not been designed well for education. We change, you know, think about it. West Campus is 50 years old. That space had been changed multiple times to the point to where we may have something listed as a classroom and, and then we're all wondering why it's not doing well with enrollment or whatever. And then you find out that there's a hole in the middle of it. Well, a lot of space like that at West Campus throughout the years was set up that way. So even though we may have had these classrooms, they were not optimum, in my opinion, for the ed side of the house to teach in them the way that, especially what we're doing these days. And so, as you guys can see, we're talking about option one, a new three-story facility, 75,000 square feet at 35 million, 100,000. And then also you can see that we're also looking at the other option um, with the, at the addition of the, the space that we would be adding here. And then that cost would be at 23 million, 500,000. And so that's what's on the table for the board. I guess what I'm asking for, the direction that I would be asking for today is which option would the board want and the chancellor and the board would want to go with um, and then, then my next steps after we take these questions and things like that, depending on what's approved or if we have to have another meeting, would be to bring our, a design team on board. Questions? I think this is the last side, right? Right, Michael? So, so, uh, so uh, can, I, can I interject for a moment? Remember, you can't vote uh, because we didn't set up the meeting that way. So just sharing your perspectives based on those perspectives uh, we could note this for next week's uh, board meeting for you to actually vote on option one or option two. Okay, so it looks like we do have some questions. Before, uh, Mr. B, Mr. B, before I recognize Mr. Hanna, I do just want to sort of state, so it looks just so I'm, so I'm fully clear, the renovation of the three buildings, including D, uh, would represent a cost savings uh, as opposed to new construction of 11.6 million. And, and, uh, and I just want to, to sort of be reassured that out of COVID, we've sort of re, we're, we are re-exploring how a lot of our programs are delivered in terms of a hybrid model. And so that's what's really has freed up the space in order to sort of revision this. And I guess my final question, which you don't have to address now, you can sort of maybe interweave it into some of the other questions, because I'm sure Mr. Hanna's questions will relate to a lot of this. Uh, our former dean, uh, you know, really had uh, a vision around embracing new and innovative and cutting edge tech technologies into the program. And I just want to make sure that we don't deviate from a lot of that trajectory. I think that was one of the things that was really distinguishing this program from others uh, locally and around the, around the region uh, and certainly the country. Uh, was that commitment to you know, very progressive, innovative uh, technological solutions to teaching. And so I just wanna make sure that these spaces, uh, when they are renovated are uh, consistent with the needs to achieve that uh, vision that we've really, I think adopted. And a lot of the reasons that we've gotten behind this allied health program, apart from of course the community need was uh, a lot of those innovative tools that we've tried out. So I just wanted to sort of Lay that comment out there. You guys can address it, I think, during the rest of the questions, but I want to recognize Mr. Hanna. Thank you, uh, Chair Klinko. So first, I'm going to start off by saying, Yolanda, congratulations, and uh, thank you for 
stepping up uh, to this position. I, should I, are you, is your title doctor? Do you have a doctorate? Okay. Um, so um, um, I, um, so when we originally talked about the option one, the separate building, we had talked uh, about uh, trying to partner with some of the local healthcare providers in terms of maybe funding or branding or something and uh, went to build that facility. Were we able to cement any of that for that first option? Uh, Board Member Hannah, I know that we we had talked, we had did have talks with them. Um, I don't think that anything was was finalized fr from that because at the end of it, because remember at that time we were also making another ask from the governor's office to hopefully get another uh, some additional dollars. Um, I do know that people are very interested about it. We've been continuously contact, but I can't. I mean, Dave may be able to speak or the chancellor. But, but we have had no further talks other than our planning process related to the ed and, and facilities plans for the district just to keep people advised of what we're actually doing. Um, but I would not doubt that there's, there's you know, I don't wanna speak for the chancellor or, or, or President Dory, but I would not doubt that those opportunities are out there for us. We just need, at the end of the day, the college is gonna to need to make a decision to do something. And, and, and to tie to what uh, Chairman Klinko said earlier too is, to, to make it clear with everyone. Also, when we looked at the remodeled space, we used the exact information that we applied to the new building. We actually applied that same, all of that data, all of that same information and in the development of the remodeled space. And, and board member Hannah, I think the, the, the one option that, you know, with the new building that we had on the table was this, this, this partnership with the clinic. To, to, and so, um, and, and maybe Bill and Yolanda can speak to that. I, I don't think that kind of partnership would be off the table with this, with this approach. No, I would not say that it isn't because we still have a partnership, even though it's not tied, uh, it's not tied to the educational side of the house, but we still have a partnership with, I think it's Marana Health at the West Campus. I mean, at the East Campus. And so I, I just think, I think when, my, the way I look at it is, is when you start building really nice and, and, and up-to-date things with the, with the latest and greatest technology and space that people really can get their arms around, just like what we just did with our cyber security facility, I think that gets people's attention. But we've got to have a plan and put it on the table for them to see and to get them hungry and stuff. I mean, that's, that's my opinion. And Chancellor is... Is any of that money that we were going asking from the state, is that sort of off the table at this point, realistically speaking, given the budget woes with COVID? And so, you know, we're still going through the process of deciding uh, what our legislative ask is going to be. Uh, there is some belief from the system level that we should just make the asks anyway, uh, even knowing that the reality is probably not likely to get much traction given the current state of affairs. Also, I, and I, I'll really wanna to point to Yolanda, I think the issue of the partnership piece, the advantage of option one was the adjacency. We can all be right next to each other. Uh, whereas in this uh, option two model is you don't get the adjacency effect but that doesn't mean that we can't still do something with the partner in that option one location potentially or somewhere else. It just won't be right there, right next to each other. But if you think about what Pima Medical has done, they've uh, bought all that land and then they, and you've seen some of those other facilities that have gone up. They're not like walk out the door and you're there. Uh, so, so keep that in mind as well. I don't know if Yolanda, if you wanna to add to that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, and I think that um, we have the opportunity, even if the facilities aren't adjacent to us, as long as they're in the same vicinity, we now have the opportunity to tap into a couple of different health agencies because we've noticed some things, um, you know, with COVID happening, we've noticed some, some things and some opportunities for partnerships with them to be right with us on campus. And I know um, El Rio was one of the... Um, facilities that was very interested and we've looked at some 
opportunities to partner with El Rio with a couple of different things. So yeah, I, I agree. Other questions, Ms. Garcia? Well, I have some questions. What about, look, um, so I'm not sure if this is an appropriate question for this meeting, but we're talking, okay, with the classroom size and the different programs coming in, are we gonna get some numbers as to how many students that can it accommodate and how flexible the classrooms are gonna be in the courses being given? For example, we had spoken before about having, uh, considering evening classes and weekend classes. Are we still only talking about an eight to five scenario for teaching? And now that we have the hybrid classes, I guess I'd like to know what the capacity would eventually become. And what is the back, you know, what is, what is the waiting list for these different programs? Because I looked at the numbers on how many people are graduating. So in, I would, you know, we would also like to know, I mean, I, for myself anyway, I'd like to know how, how long does it take to graduate from a program? How many people are enrolled? How many people drop out? And, um, and, and what's the maximum capacity that we could have? I hope that makes sense. Those, those are excellent questions, board member Garcia. And, and you know, first, I, I, you know, I'm going to ask Yolanda to weigh in. One of our challenges is, is clinical placements. That's our biggest challenge. Okay. Now, as we move to doing more things in a simulation, that there is therefore the ability for us to expand capacity. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Yolanda explain that a little more. Sure. Um, one of the, um, President DeRay is 100% right. Our, our clinical placement has been one of the most challenging things that we've been faced with right now. And if we had the ability to place students in the clinical environment more readily, we could grow our program even by 100%. Because I will tell you, you're, uh, you're right. We are turning away a significant number of students, qualified applicants um, from just the RM program, for example. And the only reason I'm gonna speak on just that program is I know it very, very well. But we're turning away, this last application cycle, we turned away 300 qualified applicants because we cannot place them out in the clinical environment. But what we've done and what we'll be able to do with the additional space is create simulation labs where we will be able to creatively break those clinical groups up and rotate students through, but put them in a simulated environment where we can mimic the exact same things that they're experiencing out in the clinical environment in a controlled area that's safe for the student um, as they're learning about the different situations. Um, and I think um, I can give you an example of numbers wise with nursing as well. Um, are in alone right. just this semester, there's 300 and or there's 428 students in program. Um, that doesn't include the LPN program, which has the capacity of another 100 students annually, and the CNA program about another 150 students. Um, I do know that radiology and respiratory still has a wait list. Nursing no longer has a wait list. We use competitive entry, but unfortunately with competitive entry, it creates these rotating um, applicants. And surgical technology is going credit. I think their capacity is about 30 students. Um, but since they're going credit right now, that's why you're seeing probably low numbers graduating from them because they're transitioning over from clock hour. And I'm still learning as I took on this new role um, more about the biomedical courses and their capacities. And, and board, board member Garcia, I also wanted to mention that Dr. Lamada Mitchell and Dr. Dolores Duran Serta are very um, intently looking at the weekend uh, model and to have a weekend cohort as well. So I just wanted to let you know that. So I, I oh. think it would definitely be helpful. Well, I, I wanted to finish up that because I think that our competition basically with the private uh, colleges that are offering these programs, this is what they offer. And if we want to be competitive, then we have to, you know, we have to uh, be the same as them. Board Member Garcia, one of the things that I would say, and I think it would be good for everybody to take note, is 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 as we all know, is our big issue isn't this isn't getting students. It's 
what, how we're utilizing our space. In other words, is, is it optimum space for us to do the teaching that we need to do? And then also the clinicals. I think like, like okay. Rhonda said, she, we could get a, a pile more students. It's just getting them, getting to be able to do clinicals. And so the reason why I say that is because if we're able to optimize our space to where we can do these virtual or, or different types of clinicals ourselves, and I think that that's something for the board to really think about as we move forward related to what we do with our space. Because right now we all know we can only get so many more students because of the amount of clinicals we can actually get in town. But if we can virtually do some of this stuff, and I don't want to speak for you, Yolanda, but I would think that we could we could probably end up getting in the business ourselves of doing some of this stuff. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned to you as well, we do have, we do offer morning courses, afternoon courses, evening courses, and I can assure you our clinicals are Monday through Sunday, and we have day shift clinicals and night shift clinicals. So we run our clinicals from 7 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m., and then we have groups going into the clinical setting from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and we allow the non-traditional student to take those like to um, self-select the late courses and then the evening and weekend clinicals as well to give them the opportunity to be able to participate in the program. So I would say- Thank, thank you. So I would say in addition to Ms. Garcia's question, if you could send the, the sort of a summary of all of the enrollments and uh, outcomes uh, to all of the board members. But I think what would also be useful uh, is what would our uh, projected enrollment numbers be based on this? Uh, based on yeah. this, so um, so I think that would be really useful. I I also think it would be very useful um, to integrate a, an RFQ or a, a very a formal RFQ process and procedure into this development for project to really solicit possible partners and sort of put it out to the community and say that we're looking to, for for partners and. We're potentially looking for a clinical partner to build maybe something separate on the campus in the footprint or maybe in the buildings. But let's just get a little clearer about what that might look like because to me that was always part of the solution too because that would help offset the, our some of our clinical deficit, especially in nursing. So I think integrating that into this would be incredibly important. Uh, my final comment would be um, I uh, would also love to know is there a difference in time frame for the two, for the two options? If we go with option one, start to finish, what's the time frame? Option two, start to finish, what's the what's the time frame? Yes, and I and I and actually I, I did not include that as part of this presentation, but I definitely we have a, a time frame, and, and as you're you're probably aware, Chairman Klinko, it'll it will go a lot faster if we build a new building, definitely. Um, uh, but the, but the, but the, but the also too, it'll go a lot faster. And like the chancellor said earlier, once we build the new building, then we've got all this space that we're going to have to deal with. Um, so I, I definitely can put that together for the board and have the grade. And Chair Klinko, we, we, we have discussed though with, with the campus and with the, uh, academic side, the, the staggered approach, because we, we do not want to disrupt these programs. Uh, and so we, we, we will need to do a staggered approach. Exactly. And so, I think I do want to make sure everybody else has an opportunity to ask questions because this item where you sort of are running up against time to move on. So Chancellor Lambert, go ahead. And then I want to make sure. Right. Uh, so the, so the other thing that we had envisioned was, the, so what the numbers we shared with you were just for new students. We haven't shared with you the potential for us to help support the incumbent workforce who needs to be reskilled and upskilled. So by having modernized facilities, building more simulation, building more augmented reality, virtual reality into what we're doing, we can become a region magnet for incumbent worker. So all of a sudden the enrollments go up significantly. Uh, so, so that's true, not only in this space, but in the applied technology areas and, and, and the other areas as well. So that's why you've seen us put a tremendous focus on having the right type of facilities because it allows us to do a lot more than just serve the new student piece, but also the incumbent workers in our community. Okay, Mr. Gonzalez, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions, but it's, uh, I'm curious to see the numbers when we come back. I think it's, it'll be interesting 
But I think it's a well thought out plan in reference to what we need in reference to addressing the needs within the community, but more important, really utilizing uh, this, unfortunately, the, uh, the COVID situation, but making the best of it in reference to what challenges it brought, but it'll uh, bring more uh, opportunities for the community and other people as well, too. Okay. Mr. Hanna, do you have any final questions? No. Nope. Ms. Garcia, any final questions? Nope. Okay, Dr. Hay? Nope. Okay, so um, so we're gonna we'll move along. I think bringing this back uh, on the next on the next on the next meeting is a good idea. I think we should put this onto the agenda to provide some formal direction. I'll tell you. I mean, I think a eleven point six million dollar cost savings is pretty significant, and I think it's certainly uh, I think it's certainly you know the prioritization of this allied health program and the consolidation of the programs into a single place was 100% consistent with the Educational Facilities Master Plan exactly. work. It was on the top priority list. We you know, have a funding model to self-fund this. Um, so I think you know, having you know, uh, Dr. B uh, provide a little bit of comment on that as well to make sure that we're still on target to be able to do that. And, um, and I, I, of course, think you know, if we can, that's a significant cost savings, but I don't want to lose that clinical those opportunities for clinical partnerships. So I think making sure that we integrate into the approach um, a way to solicit interest from the community. And maybe there are multiple groups that are interested in co-locating uh, and maybe they wanna build something new. So I, I think let's find out what the interest is too to help resolve that. So if that sounds good, we'll have it on the next, we'll have it on the, uh, on the next week agenda just for a little more discussion and follow up on some of these things. And in the meantime, Chancellor Lambert, you'll get us those inf that information on the current enrollment, current completion and retention, what the potential would look like in both scenarios, both for our existing programs and their expansion and for incumbent worker training. Does that sound good to everybody? Yes. Good. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. So moving on to our next item. So, and I just wanna say, uh, 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 Ms. McCoy Stokes, thank you very much for taking the position. I wanna echo uh, uh, Mr. Hanna, you know, it is, you know, having strong leadership in this role is so important, especially during this period where we are redeveloping this project. So uh, we really appreciate your leadership and um, for stepping in. So we look forward to working with you closely. Um, our next item is our diversity, equity, inclusion, climate, and strategic plan update. Chancellor Lambert. Yes, Chairman uh, Klinko. Um, we are so pleased to be able to share uh, uh, using a DEI assessment framework from ACCT, but another layered component to this is the uh, dashboard, which we're going to share with you around the work that has been done based on the current plan that the, the board uh, uh, saw a few years back. So with that, uh, Hilda, I'll have you uh, uh, take it away. And I believe Jeffrey, you may be helping out as well where needed. Hilda? Yes, thank you. Let me um, go over to my presentation. <laughs> Chairman Klinko, board members, chancellor, guests, and um, everyone watching out uh, virtually. Thank you for inviting us back to talk a little bit about uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and how we're doing with various pieces of the strategic plan. Uh, as I start, I just wanna give a big thank you to Maria Vasilieva from the STAR team. They've been great at uh, helping us to develop these dashboards and bringing us some data so that we can talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, um, as uh, we get started here, I just want to say that, you know, this is uh, always challenging work. I'm going to share a little bit with you about where we are, where we've been with the strategic plan. Um, but every day brings new opportunities for this work. So uh, I will start with, let's see if I can get these to advance there. I want to start with just some uh definitions, because I think it's important that we have a common language as we start to talk about uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity here. So diversity really is about representation. It's about all of the ways that the people within our organization and our community are different, that they bring different um, experiences, cultures, identities into our community. And so 
it's very broad. It's the broadest definition not only includes race and ethnicity uh, and gender, but also other groups thinking about age, national origin, religion, disability, sexual orientation, sexual uh, gender identity, socioeconomic status. So you can see all of these different things. And so diversity is about representation and what makes us all different as we come into our community. Inclusion really then is about um, building a democratic society where all members of the society are included as equal and are equally empowered. And so how do our um, different policies procedures, ways that um, the community come into our space really feel like they belong here. So it's about creating a sense of belonging, that everybody has an opportunity for success and everyone is um, equally empowered and feels like they're part of our community. Equity really is about creating conditions that allow for everyone to reach their full potential. So as an example, if we're thinking about, you know, this COVID situation that we have been in, um, we were trying to figure out how we move all of our learning environments to remote learning. And equality, often people think about equality and equity in similar ways. Equality would have been that we just give everybody the same technology, everybody gets a laptop and a hotspot and whatever software that everybody gets the same thing. But equity really tries to think about what do different learners need? What do different students need to have access to the programs that they're in? So not everybody needed a laptop. Some people need a different software. Um, some people already had Wi-Fi access. Some people needed hotspots. So equity is about trying to figure out how do we make sure that people have what they need to be successful, creating, um, treating people differently based on what they need. So those are our quick definitions. And I don't know if you all have had an opportunity to read through the Association of Community College Trustees Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Toolkit. It's a checklist that helps us to think about how we're doing this work in community colleges. Um, last year at about this time, we were in San Francisco uh, celebrating the uh, award that this board got from the ACCT about your work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I was just reflecting on how little travel I've done in the last seven months with all of the work that we typically do, but that this continues to be an important focus of our work. And so in their toolkit, it's um, about eight pages. It really uh, helps us to, again, create some of these definitions. I would recommend that as a board, uh, you could look at this as a retreat, really think about the ways in which we are meeting some of our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Um, you could just make sure, and really it's a lot of the work that we're already doing. So today's presentation is reflected in some of this toolkit. The questions that you all ask about access are part of this toolkit. Our uh, breaking student barriers is in here, you know, as we examine all of our different policies and procedures to make sure that they're not creating barriers is part of what is in here in this um, checklist of different things that we need to be thinking about with regard to equity and inclusion. And I'm gonna read you just a little piece of what is in this toolkit um, around equity mindedness. And so it talks about equity is multifaceted. It is complex and impacts all facets and all programs in community colleges. Equity in higher education refers to creating opportunities for equal access and success among historically underrepresented student populations to ensure that one, proportional participation at all, at all levels of the institution, so equitable access, two, adequate resources directed at closing equity gaps, so resource and financial equity allocation. Three, institutional leadership addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, so adaptive leadership. Four, a welcoming environment in which all diverse students can succeed. This includes race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, military status, incarceration status, ability equity, so all of these different ways and people that come into our community. And five, social mobility and economic success for all learners, so socioeconomic equity. Educational equity depends on fairness and inclusion in the educational system and includes equity in various categories. And we've talked about all of those different categories. Um, 
So inclusive, equitable, and diverse environments are essential for all students to succeed. And college leaders have a deep responsibility to ensure their college lives up to the American promise of opportunity for all, including equal outcomes among all racial and ethnic student groups in higher education. So this is part of that ACCT uh, piece. And uh, if you have it again already, I would say it, it would be good for us to continue to talk about it and think about it. It has the three different categories that help us look at what is the board doing? What is college leadership doing around some of these uh, different goals? And then how are we meeting them? What should we be doing? Now I'll give you a quick update on diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. This was in place um, before I arrived in the position. The first item on here was to establish a sustainable diversity, equity, and inclusion infrastructure, including hiring a DEI officer. Uh, the remaining ones improve recruitment and retention of employees from underrepresented populations, build diversity and inclusion competencies for employees, establish and or strengthen partnerships with organizations that provide services to underrepresented populations in Pima County, enhance and increase students' diversity and inclusion, and prepare students, faculty, and staff to adapt and succeed in a diverse global multicultural and multi-ethnic society. And so these different goals are things that I have been working on since I arrived um, as the DEI officer for the college, but really they're included in a lot of different places throughout the college as well. A couple of examples include um, the chancellor's goals every year include some aspect of this and help us in advancing these different goals. From 1819, uh, the chancellor goals talked about addressing achievement gaps and another goal in there was to develop, to start to develop the Immigrant and Refugee Student Resource Center. In the last year, 1920, from 2019 to 2020, uh, we talked about creating more connections to support underrepresented student populations in our community and um, to uh, cultivate a climate focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so throughout the college, we're working to address these, but also through specific initiatives out of my office. Now I'll go into a little bit of um, detail on each of these and where we are as we um, sort of closed out the year, extended it over this year, and are working to develop a new diversity, equity, and um, strategic plan. So first, uh, establishing a sustainable diversity, equity, and inclusion infrastructure. We are just about there. We've uh, had our office in place. I've been in the office for uh, almost three years now. I arrived in January 2018. Uh, we established the Immigrant and Refugee Student Resource Center as part of this work when we added on a person to my office. I meet regularly with campus leadership and with community to uh, look at the strategic plan as well as uh, continue to build a foundation around this work. One of the pieces why we're at 95% here is that we um, had talked about transforming this internal group that was part of the college and advising on diversity, equity and inclusion uh, into uh, a new diversity, equity and inclusion council. We've had a couple of different iterations of that being new to the community. Uh, you know, I have made a lot of different connections throughout the community, but really working to identify people to be part of this uh, work has continued to be a little bit of a challenge as we've had turnover changes and then going into uh, COVID-19. But I think this is work that uh, we're continuing to establish these different relationships across the community and we'll be uh, continuing to work this to really establish what is going to be the best way to accomplish this. Um, this is also really being informed by the town halls that we are uh, having with the chancellor and with our leadership to inform us on how uh, Pima Community College is uh, meeting some of these diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, needs of our community. The next goal was about improving recruitment and retention of employees from underrepresented populations. We uh, talked to you a little bit about this at the last board meeting and where we've been over the last several years since the chancellor arrived in his position. So here we, uh, some of the actions were around uh, regular review of applicant pools, um, the work that's being done and how we appoint search uh, committees 
and um, advertising positions in different places and monitoring this process. As we talked to you uh, at the last uh, board meeting, we have uh, re created a new framework for faculty hiring, which we piloted over this last year and continue to use. There's been a lot of work also done in human resources. So a couple of uh, quick glances at some of what is happening. This uh, slide talks about some of our metrics as they relate to uh, women in our workforce. Here, you'll see that the change has been that we are hiring more males. From uh, 2016 to 2019, uh, we have more males that have been hired. We still have more than 50% of the people in full-time faculty positions, part-time faculty positions, uh, administrator roles and other staff are still women. And administrators, um, that's shifted quite a bit. But you can see that this is something that we'll need to continue to keep an eye on, especially um, during COVID when we see that right now there are so many different uh, data showing us that women are dropping out of the workforce. So this will be one where we'll need to keep an eye and make sure that we're monitoring that, thinking about our hiring practices as they uh, pertain to gender equity. This next one, uh, it is really hard to see, and I know that we looked at it more closely last time when we met with you, but from 2016 to 2019, this is what it's looking like for uh, hiring in the different categories on, um, for race, ethnicity. Uh, you can see here that in our full-time faculty roles, there's been an increase uh, across the board some of them are very slight, but we're seeing increases in uh, representation from different race and ethnic groups. In our part-time faculty role, same thing. Uh, when you look at Latinx, we've gone from 13% to 17%. Uh, African-Americans, all of the other pieces are very slight or staying about the same. Administrators, again, a little bit of an increase. In our Latinx population, we have uh, had 17% administrators in 2016, but in this uh, last uh, reporting, 2019, we were at 23%. So not major shifts just yet, but we are seeing that. And again, um, the availability in our pools is reflected here. So we know that when we go out to recruit and hire, we are meeting some of the goals as they relate to who is available that might come in and fill this position. And this will be in your packet so you can look at it more closely. I know that these numbers are small, but the reason that I wanted to expand all of them out is because disaggregating data to as much as possible is important for us to really look at how do all of the different racial and ethnic categories look and not just put one and then say uh, white as one category and underrepresented. So I wanted to just show you that. And then here is um, just a, a glance at our applicant pools and how they have looked uh, over the last several months so that you can see that we are tracking and that we are bringing in applications from uh, various different groups. So every race category can include um, both Hispanic and non-Hispanic because of the way that we gather data. But you can see that uh, we are monitoring that, thinking about it and helping uh, different search committees understand what data they might be looking at as they're going out to search. And, and for deans and others to be able to think about the diversity of their pools as they proceed throughout the search process. Goal three is about building diversity and inclusion competencies among employees. Here you'll see we're at about 80%. We've um, really built a lot of foundations, both from my office offering different opportunities for professional development and building up uh, intercultural competence, as well as work that's being done by human resources. Here are some of the examples of the different types of uh, opportunities that our employees have as they relate to uh, training. 
So we have our college directed training over on the right and all of the different employees that have participated in all of these different trainings, including diversity awareness, unconscious bias, coping with aggressive behavior, harassment, prevention and pathways to civility and sexual harassment. Those are our uh, mandated trainings. And then over to the left, to some of our different other options that have been introduced at the college through our Office of uh, Professional Development, as well as work that we're doing out of my office. Our next one is on establishing and our strengthening partnerships with the community. We'll provide a little more detail uh, in future as we wrap up this program. But here, you know, we have increased the number of Hispanic serving institution grants that have been awarded to the college, as well as uh, through our Immigrant and Refugee Student Resource Center, re really reaching out into the community to address needs in our community that uh, have been identified for populations that haven't in the past accessed the college in uh, the same way. So trying to, again, build more equity. Five, uh, increase and enhance students' diversity and inclusion. And this both includes representational diversity. So what is the diversity of our student body as well as how are um, students progressing through the college, making sure that we are looking at all of the different metrics of success as um, students proceed through the college. Here, we're looking at some of the different metrics that we look at uh, through the STAR uh, team. This is by gender, and you can look at headcount and then degrees awarded. So from 16 to 19, what our gender diversity was. And one thing I'll point out here is that you'll notice that a number of our students don't identify as male or female. This is gonna be one place where we need to think about how we ask some of these questions and assess what our population of gender non-conforming, non-binary and trans uh, gender students are and how we might make sure that we're serving the population, tracking their progress throughout uh, through their uh, college experience. The bottom ones are about course completion rates. You can see the improvement there on course completion rates for female, male, and students that do not identify on either of those two areas. There's been improvement. Fall to spring persistence, how much are students coming back from fall into spring? Those have all seen increases. And then fall to fall retention. Uh, for male students, it's been about the same from three years ago to now, uh, but for females and students that don't identify as male or female, that's uh, improved as well. And then here we see it by race and ethnicity. And again, headcount, our headcount of Latinx students has, uh, the percentage of Latinx students has increased as well as in some of our other categories. The number of awards that we are providing for Latinx students, that number has also, uh, the percentage has gone up. And then you can see course completion rates. There's been moderate increases uh, for every student population that the percentage of courses that they are completing when they uh, register for classes. The fall to spring persistence is also uh, showing moderate increases. Um, the only exception there is for our Pacific Islander students. And I think um, one of the things to look at when you see this data is where do we need to dig a little bit deeper? Why might that be happening? And our numbers for that group are really small. So they tend to fluctuate quite a bit from year to year. They may look really like huge differences when it might be one or two students. So we need to look at that one a little bit more deeply. And then you'll see in our fall to fall retention numbers that uh, for all of those, they're either even or increasing. So it, we're, we're making sure that we're looking at all of that really disaggregated data, how are students doing and looking at you know, all of our different student populations. And then finally, we have the piece on preparing students and faculty for success in a diverse, global, multicultural, and multi-ethnic society. And uh, we're close to completing that. We'll have more data from our global partners uh, soon. That's something that, again, 
COVID has really impacted the way that we're doing this work, but we're continuing to make sure that the international students that we have are engaged with diversity, equity, inclusion, and also that students from underrepresented populations have access to those types of programs. And I know that we've shared some of that information in the past as well, that we uh, really do have good representation of Latinx students and Native American students participating in study abroad and a number of other ways that our students show that. And uh, just to close out the presentation, I know it's getting late and I'm getting close to time. Uh, we are looking at what is the future for the strategic plan? It will be, you know, what, whatever we move forward with will be informed by a comprehensive diversity, equity, and inclusion climate assessment. That team has been uh, appointed and we are meeting later this week to begin that work. The uh, Breaking Student Barriers, uh, Student Barriers Group has met and is working to make sure that we're addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion for all of our students and the community town halls will also inform how we move forward with this. And then uh, finally, really determining what pieces move into the overall strategic plan. It's important that we have a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, but that it's everybody's responsibility. We continue to talk about that, that it isn't something that's just in my office, that it is throughout the college. There are goals within the chancellor's goals, within our overall strategic plan, but then there are also pieces that we'll continue to work with out of DEI. So with that, I'll um, take any questions that you might have. Are there questions for Ms. Lautner? I have a Ms. question. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead, Ms. You're, you're muted. Ms. Garcia? You're muted. Well, I have a, okay. You can hear me now, right? I can hear you now, yes. Okay. So when, I would like to see, you know, when you said goals, that you actually have percentage of increases that we need to work on. Not just not not just looking at the numbers and saying, well, this is where we're at now. Then the other part on your community um, town halls, you know, that they not just be at the college online, that they be out in the community. I, you know, those those are my recommendations that I would like to see implemented, and maybe the board can decide whether they have any other things that they can offer. And I'm done. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, now, I think that in these last couple of years, as I said, that plan uh, was in place and I've been working with some of the uh, pieces that were there. Like I said, it has been somewhat of a challenge given the um, changes in personnel at different levels of the college, as well as the changes in our information system sometimes make it difficult to track this. And so this first few years has been really focused in on you know, these were written, how do we interpret them and work with them and setting some baselines as to where are we right now so that we can understand what the different issues are so that we can set goals. And I think that this committee that we have put together will definitely work on creating specific goals that we want to move towards and not just, now that we know what our baseline is, where do we need to go from here? All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia. Anyone else? Mr. Gonzalez? Um, no comment, but I, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Gatner. That I, it's a lot of information. It's very positive information. And I think it's uh, it's good. Um, as I mentioned, I know the challenging the times of the COVID, but I think uh, I'm very anxious and excited to see what's, what's next as well. Mr. Hanna? I would just say that uh, Ms. Ladner, you certainly have the support of this board. Uh, when we were talking about the uh, facilities master plan, I'd also like to remind uh, uh, Bill that uh, we talked about possibly giving some more room to the ISRC. Wait a minute, I don't have enough letters there. <laughs> the IRSRC, uh, IRSRC, right. Uh, the uh, to let them expand some, so we'll keep that in the plan as well. Dr. Hay, any? Okay, I would just um, I would just conclude uh, that um, I, I think the plan should really look at the AA the ACT 
diversity, equity, and inclusion checklist implementation guide. And really, it would be great if you could come to the board with recommendations on actions we could take as a body to really begin to actively implement the, that tool and to address some of the issues that are outlined in the, uh, in the plan. So, I mean, I think sort of conducting an assessment with Chancellor Lambert's, through Chancellor Lambert's office of particularly the board side, I know for us, it would be useful um, to make sure that we really are, you know, meeting not just aspirationally, but you know, actually, uh, the these uh, these these recommendations and how we implement them as and I think as quickly as possible. I mean, I think this board is committed to diversity. Everyone on this board represents uh, different types of minority uh, minority groups uh, who are part of a constellation of um, of diverse a diverse community. So um, I think that would be helpful for us as part of that plan. Chancellor Lambert, did that make sense to you? Yes, abs absolutely. Okay. But also want us to, you know, also celebrate the successes. And we have accomplished a lot over the last few years. And I think that's as important as what work remains in front of us. 100%, you know, I, 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 you know, I feel so strongly that this board really has the responsibility of setting the tone for this institution and, and in many ways for the community at large. So, um, you know, making sure that this remains front and center and a priority in our decision making um, is I think key to the success of this institution and our, the success of our students. So I, again, Ms. Ladner, thank you very much for all of your hard work. We know that this is a heavy lift and, uh, and we appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have one more item on the, uh, uh, for discussion, which is uh, acting on the findings of the program review and viability. Uh, Chancellor Lambert. Yes, Mr. Chair. So um, uh, we're excited to be able to share with you a little more comprehensive nature of program review. Also remember, go back a few years ago as we started to implement uh, an improved system. Uh, what we've already, and I think Wendy will touch on this, some of our programs have already revamped themselves as a result of the work, but I also wanna keep in mind something. When the college was first placed on probation back in the 80s, they pointed out that a specific program, but really pointing to program review really needed to, to be addressed. HLC over the years have pointed out the need for the college to do better around program review. I think what you're starting to see now is we're actually doing it. Uh, but another important piece, and maybe Wendy will touch on this, is the HLC has put in their language now recently that colleges not only address program review, but act on its findings of program review. And that's an important change. And I think what it's going to represent as we go forward, not just as Pima, but all colleges and universities is I would not be surprised in future visits of the HLC, they're gonna start focusing on this program review issue more and more with all colleges and universities in our region. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Wendy. I believe you're gonna step in for Dolores. Uh, am I right to say that or was it Bruce? Kind of, thank you, Chancellor. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or early evening. Actually, Dr. Moses was gonna start. He wanted to address you first, but he just sent me a text that he was kicked out of the meeting by the host. Can he please get back in <laughs> is what he's asking for. Um, if he doesn't show up in a minute, I will start without him. Yeah, I, I only see you on my screen, Wendy. Yes, it, I'm sorry. It came up as um, Dolores, and we weren't sure who that was. He should have had his own link, but we're sending him right one right now. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Um, if he doesn't arrive, okay. Hey, hey, Wendy, while we're waiting, I can let the board know that, that actually this is part of the, what you guys are going to see when we meet with you in December related to the ad and, and facilities plans is actually they did meet with Wendy and Bruce and had a long discussion about program review in general. And so that will actually be part of uh, some of the information that we'll be providing to you guys in December. Thank you, Bill. Yes, yeah. we have been corresponding and I appreciate all the support you have given us. Well, um, thank you guys. I know you. it's a lot of heavy lifting on your end. <laughs> thank you.
Dr. Mosan. Uh, from what I can tell, I don't know, Andrea, it looks like he's having trouble. I may go ahead and start. Um, if I Why don't miss you go day. ahead, Wendy? Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Wendy? All right. Thank and you. Wendy, we just also, the board wants to recognize, we know that you were not scheduled to do this. So we just want to recognize that, you know, we appreciate always your expertise and insight and, uh, and we really appreciate you being here on short notice to, um, to fill in. So thank you. Thank you for your graciousness. I appreciate that. Stephen, could you please share your screen for us? Thank you. And go ahead and go to the first slide. So this is what the chancellor was talking about is the first thing we want to do is put up the criteria related to viability and program review. And there has been some new language added to it. And he mentioned that language and it's in bold under 4.8.1. We will practice regular program reviews and we will act upon their findings. And so one of the things that we have um, not particularly done in the past, but this also was in the language is act on those findings. So what you see here on this slide, I won't read it to you, but essentially all programs have to go through program review. And we're looking for how are those programs doing? How are they graduating students and what kind of time frame? So a lot of the things that were actually mentioned earlier when Yolanda was on. So these are the kind of things we look for. Also the college can set the criteria it looks for as well. So when the HLC comes, they will ask us, what is your criteria for program review? What are you looking at? Well, there's some, a number of things we can look at. They just want to make sure that we're following what we claim we're going to look at. For example, how many graduates do we have? And that's a big one right now. We can also look at wage data. We can also look at the number of jobs in the state of Arizona or whatever is designated. So this is the criteria. All colleges, all institutions have to do it. Um, before I flip off this slide, is there anything in particular anybody wants to ask on that before I ask Stephen to take the next slide? No. Okay. Stephen, can you take the next slide, please? Gladly. All right. So uh, this is our process of program review. The focus here is that our program reviews follow a repeatable process uh, that follows kind of our plan, implement, measure, act model. That's our PIMA model. And so every program is scheduled to go through program review once every four years. Uh, from there, once, uh, once we've notified the program that they are doing program review for the year, we go and train the discipline coordinators and the department heads on how to complete the assessment in our assessment management system. Uh, that is where we collect all of our SLO data, our student learning outcome data, as well as our program reviews are all housed in a single system. After that, the deans and the provost uh, approve or um, send the program review back for further revisions. And lastly, the programs act upon the results. And so that's what we call closing the loop when we use that phrase is that results are acted upon and we go back and remeasure it uh, afterwards to see if the changes that were made in the program were effective or whether uh, further changes are needed. And the results of the program review can be uh, that the program is uh, on an improvement plan. It could be merged with another program. Perhaps you would merge like a degree and a certificate. Uh, you could have an inactivation of a program or maybe you look at the program and decide that uh, no revisions are needed currently. Thank you, Stephen. And I would like to go ahead and invite Dr. Moses, who I hear is now back online. He had some eloquent words for the opening. I'd like to <laughs> invite him to do that. Bruce? Oh, well, thank you for letting me back in. Actually, I, I don't really need to add anything. You guys have done a fantastic job. The only thing I would add is that uh, we have both internal and external um, 
uh, you know, expectations and requirements for uh, program review. Uh, we, you know, the purpose of why we do program review internally is really to help inform our broader community about the viability of our um, academic programs. Again, like Stephen said, if there's areas for improvement based on feedback that may come from our, um, you know, our uh, board, uh, community boards, um, advisory boards, and then as well as they're sure that, the, you know, the programs are really currently in aligning with our college mission, our core things, and what is expected from us, from our students um, and our external stakeholders. Uh, so that's really our, our, you know, our internal expectations for our programs. And then Wendy just covered what our external expectations are from our accreditor who requires us to have some form of um, standardized comprehensive program review process that we undertake for all of our programs, as well as the Department of Education who takes a look at our programs as well and want to make sure that they're viable as well because they are the ones who are providing us um, with Title IV financial aid to, um, you know, award to students to engage with and, and, and select these programs and, and attend our college. So we have both internal and external expectations of this. So that is why we do program review. That's the purpose of program review. Thanks, Dr. Moses. Thanks. Stephen, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, this one has our top 20 programs by graduates. And the graduates are based on a three-year average. Those are kind of metrics that have been set up in the past. So we do use a three-year average on these metrics. You will also notice some colors, the green. So right now, our green beans, they graduate 10 students or more on average every year. So these are our green ones, and you can see our top 20 programs on here. We have some more that are in the green that graduate at least 10 students per year, but these are our top 20. You'll notice our AJAC A and our AJAC S, which are our transfer courses that students can get that AJAC and transfer to one of our three universities is really high and at the top of the list pretty much across the board. So we do know students are taking their AJAC and leaving us. Okay, Stephen, could you go to the next slide, please? All right, these are our 2017 versus 2020 comparisons. And this is only a selection. We met with the provost and we selected some just to show you. And the first one is our translation and interpretation study certificate. This one is unique. The chancellor mentioned that some of these programs reorged themselves. Our translation interpretation studies is the only one that went from graduation rate on average below 10 students. It was at 8.7 in 2017. And they're now graduating on average 16. They have gone up. They have done a good job at bringing themselves up. Uh, the next one, the HVAC certificate. It was in the red in 2017, meaning under 10, and it's in the red now. Same thing with dental lab. And then there's automotive. Automotive was in the green in 2017, and it's in the green now. This is just a small sampling we were asked to show you of comparisons and some of the stuff we do. Uh, last slide, Stephen, please. All right, this is our programs with under 10 graduates on a three-year average. And this is right now, today, what's going on. So these are all of the programs, we call them in the red because their graduations of students are under 10. So these are the ones that are struggling programs right now. And I think you will find across the board, if they're struggling now, they were struggling in 2017. And I think that's pretty much universal. 
with that, that's all I have. We are now open for questions, unless Stephen um, or Dr. Moses, you have any other comments before questions? I do not. I don't either, Wendy. Thank you. Or are there any questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Hanna. So, so when we make decisions on, when we do the program review and we make decisions, um, we don't just use numbers. Is that correct? I mean, we don't, I mean, if, if um, the, a program may have some value to it more than just the number of graduates. Is, is that correct or I'm off base here? Uh, Bruce, did you want to take that? I saw you flash. No, I, you could take it right. Either one, we probably, we're going to say the same thing, I'm sure. Okay, go ahead, sir. <laughs> you can take it. So you're, you're correct, um, uh, Mr. Hanna. Um, there's context. You could there's context to to always to all to data, and you can look at um, you know these programs, um, and you know they may have you know community value. They you know when we look at programs, and I'm just going to use for example, um, you, you know, Alanda talked about the wait list. She talked about the number of students that we had to turn away, um, you know, in nursing. Um, nursing, nursing is one of the programs that we probably don't make a lot of money on. If uh, you know, if not, we'd be good. We'd be um, happy to break even. However, we know every one of those graduates is going to get a job somewhere in the community. So, the, you know, but some of these programs that are on this list, um, there is context to them. You might, they may have value. They may have value to the community. Um, but what we're doing is we're, we're simply applying certain metrics and indicators to each one of our programs because we have to, such as enrollments, such as persistence, retention, and completion, such as um, employability, um, wage earnings, and we use uh, those different me metrics to, turn, to determine the health and viability of the uh, of programs. You, when you look at some of these programs, um, Mr. Hanna, I'm sure you probably scratch your head and say, well, wow, you know, I, I wouldn't think that this program would be, um, you know, on this list. But, you know, uh, some of our programs where we might be oversaturating the market um, with, with graduates, along with our sales of other institutions in our community. For example, um, there may be only be, you know, a, you know, 40 cabinet making positions in, the, in Pima County. And we and we're in, in together with multiple institutions, we're producing 200 cabinet makers, you know, every year. So there's always context to data, but that's not the only thing that we do that we look at. Um, but it is the driving factor for uh, program review. May I, may I chime in on, and tag on to that just a bit? So if we look at the architectural technician cert, it's the one on the right, third down. And in there, they have a bunch of courses. One thing we find out is let's say hypothetically to get that certificate, there's six courses that are needed. Four of those courses may be in great shape. The courses fill, they run but two of those courses don't have course enrollment. So not only are we hurting the program because they don't have graduates, but that means we're running courses with low fill rates, which cost us money as well. So that doesn't mean all of the courses in that certificate go away. We can keep those four courses that have high enrollment and more than likely what's happening is those four courses are used in other certificates. So it's got multitudes of students in there from a variety of certificates, but the, the two courses that aren't filling, um, that the, those are the only courses that are specific to that architectural technician cert. So just because a program might go away doesn't mean all of the courses would. And I think that's a lot of the confusion out there. If we could keep the courses in here, that have these high enrollments, but students aren't taking these programs is, is what it boils down to. They're not taking all the courses to finish their certificate, but that doesn't mean all these courses have to go away. We keep the ones with high enrollment that students are really asking for. Okay, so I 
what might be useful then, because I mean, clearly we need to, some sort of recommendation because we need to make a decision, right? I mean, that's where we're headed. We've been talking about this for the entire time I've been on the board. So, um, so I, I think, you know, what would be useful is to maybe have a tier one and a tier two recommendation and then outline some of that detail in, as part of the recommendations that really clarify you know, what is, you know, are we actually zeroing out a line? What, what are we really talking about in terms of the removal of the program or the, you know, sunsetting of, the, of this particular certificate or, um, or credential? And I think that would be helpful. And, you know, I think becoming a sort of a bulk recommendation in, a, in like a tier one, tier two, what the teach out's gonna look like. Um, you know, I mean, some of these that have no graduates I mean, I think I think we I think we, we probably need to create some sort of rolling policy where if there are just no graduates, the program just automatically sunsets. I mean, there needs to I think be a process rather than belaboring this for years and years uh, and keeping sort of these these things on the shelf. But I, I think we would turn to you to provide the guidance on what those what that sort of policy framework may look like. Answer Lambert. Sure. I'm curious, but everybody. So. so uh... I, I you know, there's so many different elements to all of this. So what you're going to be seeing at the college is this notion of what we're referring to as universal design, where we take a relook at the entire curriculum, how we build a course, how we build a program. And when we build them, we should be building them with non-credit as well as credit in mind, but also how they align with the certificate or degree some cases we don't need a certificate, we just need the degree. In some cases we don't need the degree, we just need the certificate. So that goes back to Wendy's point. Some of the courses are probably good, but, they're, but the students aren't taking all of the courses they need for the certificate. And that's why they're showing up on here when really it's the courses, if they were better aligned say to the degree, then you don't have a problem here. So it's not just about closing out is my point, uh, some of this is just revamping what you see here, make it better than what it currently is. And we have some examples of that already. And then you see HVAC here. We're in the process of revamping HVAC. Uh, so even though it doesn't look good right now, it's going to get better over time. Uh, so just keep all of that in mind. But there are some here we really do believe needs to be uh, closed out as well. But we can build that. Uh, tier structure you're you're talking about so you can so we can illustrate what's in a revamping category what's in a merger category what's in a closeout category okay that to me that sounds smart i mean I, I think we just need to sort of i mean some of these programs we've been talking about the sort of enrollment issues that have been plaguing them for a long time i think coming up with a a really key process so that there's just a little more certainty to the people who are interested in these programs, to the people who are teaching these programs, to the institution as a whole. And I, you know, and I mean, and there are also environmental changes. I mean, I read in the paper last week that a, you know, a sports fashion company is moving from the Pacific Northwest to Tucson and bringing, you know, a lot of jobs and a lot of interim, intern positions. I, I would suspect that that would link up with one of our programs on this list. So making sure that we are responding to the environmental changes that are occurring and that we can, in the same way that we did with Caterpillar and standing up a program to be able to serve the needs of that particular industry for their, and that was a non-credit program, to figure out how to do that in the same way and sort of have that rapid response, I think would be valuable. Um, so Lee, do you, Chancellor Lambert, do you see a sort of terms of times at the time frame. are you gonna bring forward a formal recommendation early next year? When, why do you see a sort of a time frame? And then so I want to so make let, me, let me sit down with the team and we'll, cause we're, we're constantly looking at these things. So like you'll see on this upcoming board agenda, we have some items that we're, we wanna close out. So it's, it's an ever evolving process, uh, but we'll, we'll categorize them better so you can see where they are in our process in terms of those tiers, what we really believe that we can revamp. And if you take fashion design as an example, uh, and you take this new company coming in, just like with your Caterpillar example, that made more sense to do non-credit than to do credit. But it didn't go away, it just went into a different format, right? 
So, so we just have to look at things from that lens. And, and that's, that's a different approach than how we've uh, examined things in the, in the past. But also remember, we just got this grant to do this really innovative work with the Ed Design Lab, with other, a few colleges across the country to create micro pathways. So this is, again, a whole new level of work that goes back to your environment uh, point. So we may look at some of these and say, that might be better for a micro pathway as opposed to a full loan certification or degree. Chancellor, if I could add something too, um, I, just, I think it's important to note too, that if a program, um, for example, um, we want to bring a program back, it is very easy to bring a program back. And like it's, it sounds like it's very challenging um, to get rid of programs or inactivate them, but it is so easy to bring a program back. It's just a matter of saying, okay, you know, we're, we need to design it with the right, right curriculum um, or redesign it with a better curriculum, as the chancellor mentioned, and then bring that program back. Um, but one of the other things I wanted to share, too, is about, you know, data in the past that Pima had. We have very good, reliable program of study data from our students. And that has, that's something that has evolved since 2017 as well. We've had over 6,000, 7,000 students change their program of study since August of 2019. So just a little over a year. That was part of the work we did in cleaning up um, you know, some findings from our A133 audit. So we feel at no better time in the college over the last four to five years do we have accurate data of um, where our students are and what programs they're in. And a, some of this that you're seeing is previously in the college, students would walk through the front door. They don't really know what they want to do. They select something. And then what they end up doing is defecting from these programs and going into something else. If you looked at the data earlier that Wendy showed that was in the green, notice how many students graduated with an AJAC and then left the college on average. So, you know, so that that also is impacting those numbers in the red. Some of those students were in those programs in the red, they got the AJAC, and then they left and transferred on to one of the universities. So there's a residual effect when students don't complete a degree or certificate with us and only complete the AJAC. So this, and you could see that our top two pro performers right here is AJAC A and AJAC S. So there's a correlation as well with, between the data that's here in the green and the data that's in the red. Thank you, thank Chancellor. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Moses. Um, are there any other questions from the board? We have a few minutes left. I just want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask any questions. Okay. Hearing no none. questions. Ms. Garcia, nothing? Checking. Mute. Okay. Um, we are our next which is thank you very much. We really appreciate it. We'll look forward to uh, we'll coming me. Our final uh, item is our action item three, which is a contract to our easement. The recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Chancellor recommends the Governing Board authorize the Chancellor or designee to execute a right-of-way easement with Tucson Electric Power Company to provide an electrical utility, electric utility service connection to the new automotive technology and, inno and innovation center at the downtown campus. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, second from Mr. Hanna. Uh, discussion? Um, I, I, is there any questions from the board? Nope. Okay, I just have one question. Is it underground or is it above ground? So Bill, will you, uh, are you still on Bill? You're, you gotta unmute on, yourself. You're on mute. Mr. Board, you're still muted. You're still, Bill, Bill you're, you're muted. Still muted. Yeah, I, I'm trying. There, there you go. There, there you go. Got it. Now we lost him.
Well, it needs so, to hear me now. Can you hear me? There you go. All right. Sorry. I don't know what it kicked me out here, but uh, it's underground. Underground. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay. Hearing no other questions. No other questions. Okay. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And with that, Thank you, board. our meeting is adjourned. All right. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone.